Amen. It's worship time, beloved. God has been truly good. What do you say? Hallelujah. Now it's time to worship God in spirit and in truth. Amen. The Lord is our shepherd and we shall not want for he had made us to lie down in green pasture and so we serve a great god who's worthy to be praised today what do you say again we want to thank god for this beautiful day we want to thank god for all those online viewers and everyone who is a visitor and everyone who has come here to just praise god without any a reaction because you know what God has done for you. Amen. Hallelujah. Eternal Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for what you have done and what you have continually do in our lives, O oh Lord. Disappoint us not, O oh Lord, as we come boldly before your throne right now, Lord, looking for a word today. May you bless your uh, visitors today, Lord. May you bless those who have just come to hear something that will stimulate their hearts and their mind that they may continue to run on just a little further. So we thank you, Lord, for what you're about to do. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, amen and amen. reaffirm our affirmation of faith which is found in Exodus chapter 20 verses 8 through 11 and if you can just repeat with me remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy six days shall thou labor and do all thy work but the seventh day of the Sabbath of the Lord thy God in it thou shalt not do any work thou nor thy son nor thy daughter thy main servant, nor thy maid servant, nor the cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in the six days the Lord had made and see and all that therein and is and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. God bless you. You may be seated.
Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Amen. It's a little warmer inside here, isn't it? Who's saying that much? You want to go outside? <laughs> it's 30 degrees outside. Praise the Lord, everybody. We're just grateful to be in the house of the Lord today, to worship, to praise, and to adore his holy name. Because that's what we were created for, to praise him. He's good. He's merciful. He's long-suffering. And he is a loving God. He loves you with an everlasting love. And that I can deal with. Can you? Can you deal with that? So you can't do anything to stop God from loving you. He loves you regardless. I want to welcome everyone to this worship service today. I want to welcome our visiting friends. Do we have any visitors in the house today? Visitors, could I see your uplifted? Oh, thank you. What's the name? Let's welcome her. Thank you so much. Anybody else visiting with us today? Okay. We welcome our regular members to church today. It's good to see you. I haven't seen you since last week. So it's good to see you. You know when you, when you have your family member and you don't see them for a while, Brother West, and then they show up, you appreciate them, okay? Just like I appreciate you seeing you out to church back in your deacon uniform today. Praise the Lord for Brother West. Let's give him a big amen. Uh, the pastor today is on assignment in the city of New York. He is worshiping with his father today, not his heavenly father, but his biological father. And uh, they having a dedication for the building. Are you ready, Sister Tamika? Okay, he has greetings to you right now. Happy Sabbath, saints of God. I pray that you are having a blessed So again, we extend a warm welcome to our guests, our first, second, or third time visitors. We're just so grateful uh, that you've chosen to be with us today. I am Pastor Edsel Cadet. You might be wondering why I'm on the screen and not there in person. Some of you may know that my father is a pastor in the Northeastern Conference. He pastors the Bethlehem Seventh-day Adventist Church in Queens. And funny story, my father became a pastor after I became a pastor. So I'm not walking in his footsteps, but in a funny way, He's kind of walking in mind. In any case, um, my father's ministry has been blessed in that they were able to purchase a $1.2 million facility for them to worship in in Queens after renting for many years. Uh, the Lord has blessed them in this way. And today they are inaugurating the building uh, and worshiping in the building. So I am down in Queens with my family. Nyasha and I are there uh, to support them on this day. I want you to know that while we are away, we do miss you. Uh, we do uh, continue to hold you in our hearts and, and in our prayers. And we look forward to being back with you next Sabbath so that we can worship together uh, all in the same place. Uh, before I get off the screen, I just want to remind you of a few things. One, we are having communion on December 31st, the very last Sabbath of this year. So let us prepare our hearts and our minds for communion. Let's put aside rivalries and bickering and issues and challenges. Uh, let's make sure that we're reconciling one with another so that our hearts are prepared to receive communion. 
Uh, in communion, we engage not only in the taking of the emblems, the bread and the wine, but also in foot washing. So we invite you to be with us and to join us uh, for communion service on December 31st. Also, we invite you to join us for our New Year's Eve service happening that very evening. That very evening, we're getting back together for a night of prayer, praise, and testimonies. God has been so good over this last year. In spite of the challenges, in spite of the issues, God has still blessed us, and we are here to give Him praise. So we invite you to join us that evening for our New Year's Eve service as we engage in prayer, praise, and testimonies. Your life will be the sermon that is preached that evening. So we invite you to come to join us as we praise God for 2022 and as we, and as we pray for him to cover us in 2023. Last but not least, saints of God, um, I, I watch the news. I see that, that COVID and other viruses are on the uptick. So I just want to uh, invite you to be cautious, do what you have to do to protect yourself and to protect others as well. Uh, I know that church is a place where we love to hug and handshake and do all of these things to greet each other, uh, but please be cautious, protect yourself, protect others uh, during this season where uh, the virus seems to have a bit of an uptake, um, even in our church. So our prayers are with you. I look forward to worshiping with you, and I look forward to seeing you next Sabbath and also at prayer meeting this upcoming Wednesday. God bless you, saints of God. Take care. Amen. That was our pastor. Um, I have a couple of announcements that I would like to add. Is that the 110 committee would like to inform the church that we have this Sabbath and next Sabbath only to do our advertisement in the 110 journal for those individuals who want to do a half a page honoring somebody uh, honoring their family or just want to put a, a full page ad in terms of giving support to the church and the mission to which the church is called, you can do that. So the deadline is going to be on the 17th. After the 17th, then it's all over. We will get the journal into print. So those of you who are interested, you could do a family portrait, you could do an individual portrait, you could do a departmental thing, whatever your committee decides that they want to do, you can do it, all right? So we, we thank the 110 committee, and let's give them a big amen. amen. Come on, folks. We can do better. Let's give them a big amen for the work that they're doing. Amen. amen. Praise the Lord. We're also happy that we are going to be engaging in a communion service where we will have regular foot washing and also the serving of the emblems. There's one or two logistical situations that we have to work out, but we're going to get it done. The elders and the deacons and deaconesses, you're asked to be here the Friday night before the communion. What day is that? What date is that? What is it? The 30th? Okay. Please mark your calendar. And we're going to have this rehearsal so that we can go into uh, a really good, consecrated communion service. Amen? We need that at this time. And it's also an opportunity. For you, if you know someone of art against you, or you're not on speaking terms with somebody, which happens in families sometimes, you can make right with that individual before you come to do communion. Is that all right? Yes, God is watching and he's taking note. 
So let us do that so that we can go into 2023 on a high spiritual note. And the Lord will certainly bless us. So praise God for that. And uh, we will continue with our program as Brother, Brother Bernard comes up. I must also remind you that we are in the given season. We're not out of the woods where finance is concerned. As a matter of fact, now is a time when we need more finance than ever. We're very grateful that in spite of the obstacles that we face in the last four weeks on the administration side of the building, we have heat today. Come on, folks. You know why I'm excited that we have heat over there today? Because our young people, that's where they have their Sabbath school. And they were at a disadvantage. They couldn't really enjoy the Sabbath school. They didn't feel like coming out to sit in the cold. And so for that reason, I'm happy that they could enjoy their Sabbath school time today in the want of the administration building. Let us remember to continue to pray for our young people and support them in every way we can. So I'd like you to dig a little deeper in your pocket today for the R Fund. Those who have their cash app, you can do that via cash app and also make a special donation to the R Fund. Remember the R Fund is different from your regular tithe and offering. This is called a restoration fund because we certainly not finish with our project of getting the church complete so that you and I can enjoy this beautiful building. We still need to fellowship one with the other in the fellowship hall. We still have other places to take care of. So God bless you as you give unreservingly to him today. Brother Bernard. time where everyone can participate in the service and before the deacons and ushers wait on us for tithes and offering I have a scripture that I'd like to read and uh, just make a brief commentary this comes from 2nd Corinthians 9 verse 7 each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give not reluctantly or on a compulsion for God loves a cheerful giver. This is a very uh, familiar text. And what I draw from this is that God does not expect us to give what we do not have to give. But he expects us to be charitable. It is not the amount that is most important in terms of what we give. Rather, it is the state of our hearts and our motivations. We should give enough so it does not become a burden and lead us to feel feelings of reluctance or compulsion while at the same time not too little which may cause feelings of guilt for not doing our part but i'll leave it just um spoke about the work that needs to be done we can feel very good about if we look around this um, section of the building feel very good about what has been accomplished so far but there's more to be done so we need to give sacrificially so as the deacon and the ushers come forward let me just say a brief prayer lord god we want to give you thanks and praise first of all for bringing us uh, bringing us here safely this morning we pray lord for all your blessings for your mercy and your grace and as we give to you dear father god we pray that we will be stewards and be good stewards and that the treasury department and the leaders of this church will use this these funds and um so that it may be a blessing to every member of this church and to the community. We thank you and we give you thanks and praise. Amen.
The Christian on his knees see farther than the, Christ, the philosopher standing on his toes. This is a time when God's people speak with him in prayer. A special time when God listened at all times, but this is a time when his people speak to him. Know that many of us have requests. We have thankfulness to give to God. So today, talk with the Lord in prayer. Shall we bow our heads? Kind and most gracious, loving Heavenly Father, in whose hands lies power and great glory, the God whom angels worship and even fall prostrate at his feet. We, your people, do venture to approach the mercy seat. Nothing in our hands we bring but simply to the cross we cling. We thank you we are alive and we are well. You woke us up this morning and you clothe us in our right minds. You have brought us here in the house of worship and we are grateful to you. Nothing that we have has been promised. We are not deserving, but you have said in your words, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And you said that our bread and our water is cure, secure. So we thank you from the recesses of our hearts for your thoughtfulness that you remember every one of us standing here this morning with those that are listening and viewing online. You have made plans that they would have been here. You have looked down through the annals of time and you know that this morning your people would be speaking to you at this time so you have a special gifts that you have waiting for those sometimes we do not get what we need because we do not ask but lord we are asking you this morning for mercy that you look down upon eyes with the eyes of pity and with the bowels of compassion for mercy we need and mercy we plead. Come here in our midst and may we feel your presence. Lord, without you, we are nothing, but with you, we are more than conqueror. We realize in your words you said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And with that in mind, every move we make, we give thought that you are hearing, you are listening, and you are doing what you do best. You are God, you are God all by yourself. Even the songwriter said, I search all over, but I could not find nobody, because there is nobody greater than you. You are God, and you told us we should look to you. We we are living in a world where uh, many are doing different things because of what their mind tell them to do. But you have counseled that we should follow the thus set the Lord. And even when we read the Bible, we should understand it in a way that you have directed. Because you even said, when the Holy Spirit shall come, he will teach us all things. And you have sued have sent that Holy Spirit. So we are thankful today, Lord, that whatever we ask in your name, believing that you will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. We ask a special blessing. And everyone who participate in your service today, for those who play on the instrument, for those who give the songs of folk, we pray for every man. We pray, Lord, 
that you remember in a very special way, the one that you have appointed to break the bread of life. We know, Lord, that what he has prepared, that he prepared it physically and mentally. But let us hear, not from him, but let us hear from him, for, through him, from you, through him. Help, Lord, that the words that he speak become life and power, not because he has power, but because you have power, and you can do all things. Let us do not, we are in a time when we, we look around us and everybody is doing their own thing. But the Bible tells us we should do the thus said the Lord. You and only you are the one who will lead us into the path of righteousness. That the psalmist said that the, uh, that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And we know that there's nothing we can accomplish without you. But with you, all things are possible. So we pray this morning that in our nothingness, you will come in your mighty power and you'll shed abroad your Savior's love in this cold heart of our. Bless us individually. Bless us collectively. Help us that we will not leave this place the way we come in this morning, but we will leave with having a closer walk with you. Lord, we love you, but you first loved us because even while we were yet sinners, you died for us. You died to redeem us back into your fold. So Lord Jesus, keep us faithful. Grant us the peace which passeth all understanding. Keep us from the hands of wicked men and from evil angels. Help us to remain faithful. Bless us now, bless us then. And then Lord, when you shall come, save us. Save us in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people says, Amen. Everybody, worship, and we're going to use our hymns so that we can give God the praise. I want everybody to sing with me because y'all know I get a little nervous, so I want y'all to praise the Lord with me. So we're going to sing Psalm 341 to God be the glory. That's the person that we're supposed to give God praise to anyway. So let's just light it up right now. Everybody, sing along with me.
song, and this one is actually one of my favorite hymns in the whole wide world. And it is 526, Because He Lives. And you know, it, it's one of those songs that, you know, whenever you're going through something, it helps you remember that Jesus is there for you no matter what you're going through. And it is not an easy road being in the Christian walk, especially they, nowadays they want to tear us apart and say that we're just, you know, crazy and we don't believe it. We know God is there for us no matter what. And we're going to give him the praise. It is because he lives. Scripture reading. Today's scripture reading will be taken from Luke 8, verses 43 to 48. And it reads, And a woman having an issue of blood twelve years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood staunched. And Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude thronged thee and pressed thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And Jesus said, Somebody had touched me, for I perceive that virtue is gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him, 
she declared unto him for all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith had made thee whole. Go in peace. May God bless the hearing, reading, and understanding of his word.
wonderful. He's wonderful. I'm glad that we serve a God who loves us so much that he came and gave his life a ransom for his people. I want to welcome all those who are here this morning. Uh, many of us had a rough week. I, 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 my week was so rough that I was reminded by the word of God that I had 52 extra vacation days in the year. 52. And just when I was slowly going out of my mind, the Sabbath showed up. I don't know about you, friends, but I'm excited to be here this morning with God's people. It's a blessing to be in the house of God when, when folks and your jobs push you around and turn you around and, and the cares of life pressing on you and you wonder if you're going to make it. And then the Sabbath showed up and you get excited all over again because there's something about the Sabbath that keeps us in our place. I'm glad that God loves us so much that, that he, he, he cut out one day in the week. One of my favorite preachers say, says it, it's a cathedral in time that God gave us a Sabbath in time that we, we could leave all the cares of life. Forget about the job, forget about the bills, forget about your problems with your wife or your husband, your children. Forget about all the problems that you face and spend time with God. I'm glad that we are here this morning in the house of God. And I know that God has a blessing for us this morning. I, I don't know what I'm going to say to you today, but let God speak to you this morning. And whatever he has to say to you, I, I want to let you know that you will be richly blessed. So I pray this morning that as I, I stand before you and God, that he will speak to us this morning and our souls will be satisfied. Every time I, I stand before the people of God to present his word, I recognize that there's a pressure that sits on me. There's, I don't have no control over that. There's a pressure, and, and that pressure never leaves me until God is true with me. I recognize that a preacher never makes a good sermon. I don't care how skillful he is. I don't care how good he knows his Bible. A preacher never makes a good sermon. When a sermon works, it's Jesus. Are you listening to me today? And this morning I pray, I, I want someone to pray for me this morning that God will speak through me and you will not see clear and walk, but his people will see Jesus. Oh, it is Jesus. Oh, it is Jesus, it is Jesus in my soul, for I have touched all the hem of his garment. with me. Oh, it is Jesus, yes, it is Jesus in my soul, for I have done to the hem of his this morning to Luke chapter 8. Won't you stand as we read the word of God and we'll read alternately. Luke chapter 8 reading from verses 40 through 48. Luke chapter 8 reading from verses 40 through 48 and we'll read alternately. I'm reading from the amplified version and this is what it says. Now as Jesus was returning to Galilee, the people welcomed him for they had all been expecting him.
for he had only one daughter about 12 years old and she was going she was dying but as Jesus went the people were crowding against him almost crushing him came up behind him and touched the fringe of his outer robe and immediately her bleeding stopped Jesus said someone did touch me because I was aware that power to heal had gone out of me <laughs> 48 together <coughs> and he said to her daughter your Oh, peace. I have entitled, can you can be seated. I have entitled my message for today. She didn't have a name. She didn't have a name. Today, my friends, we, we, we go to the Bible to find this powerful Jesus. I, I, I don't know about you, but, but when I think of how powerful Jesus is, I lose my fear for any problem that faces me. And that's, that's a consolation that we have. In, in, in the preceding verses, in, in verse 43, the, the text tells us that Jesus was returning from Gennesaret. He, he was hot off the healing of a demoniac and on his way to Galilee to restore to life a dead millennial. Here we see Jesus just breathe life into a dead millennial. And in the midst of resurrecting the millennial generation, the baby boomer generation was on the verge of extinction. And Jesus did something that only he can do, which was to resurrect from the dead physically and spiritually the two generations that would, would tell the world unequivocally of a Jesus that is able to save, heal, and restore completely those who come to him by faith. Now I can, I, I can see this woman. I, I can see her and her family, she and her family going to church. She was all beautifully decked with all the trimmings and accessories that accentuated her beauty. I, I can see her husband looking at her and licking his lips like he's having a three-course meal. And as she walked into the temple, her, her physiognomy demonstrated that, that she had the whole J-Lo, Serena Williams mashup going on. Simply translated, she was a fine black sister. But, but, but somehow, but somehow this woman found herself trapped in a situation that caused her to hemorrhage for 12 years and caused her whole world to turn upside down. See, there were some folks in the church that knew this woman. They, they, they knew she was, she was looking good. They knew she, she looked nice coming to church. They, they knew she loved God. They, they knew all the good things about her. But now she got sick and, 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 and all these people who knew her, the, the, the water cooler conversation started. And you could hear some of the, sis, some of the sisters saying, you, you, remember that, you remember that sister? That sister who used to look fine coming to church? Did you hear what happened to her? And, and, and even the people who didn't even know her name because she didn't have a name. They were saying that sister, that sister that she was all looking good coming to church. You know what? She's now sick. She doesn't come to church no more. Her whole family doesn't come to church because they can't come because she's sick. And she's unclean. And, and they started gossiping about this sister. But, but she didn't care. And people keep talking. And the whole world was turned upside down because of her malady. Friends, you will, you, you will read in the Bible and you will not find this woman's name. She's known by her problem. She's known by her situation. 
But the Bible didn't take time to mention her name. In fact, she's practically anonymous, except for the fact that the Bible talked about her problem. She's known, if you please, not by her name, but by her problem. The Bible said her illness was one that robbed her of her money. Folks, let's get real. No matter what problem you have, if it makes you poor, then you have another problem. There, there are many scholars that believe that the woman may have this or that other malady, but the fact is that her problem was sensitive. One that was connected to her gender. And perhaps one that she didn't want to discuss with everybody. And you know the reason why. Because people would, was talking about her. Don't think we are immune from that. Even in our churches today. I don't know about Berea. We might not have these people inside here. But sometimes folks know your business. And everybody know. The folks in the world might hear about your job, but they, they don't tell nobody. You tell church folks your business. It's a whole different ballgame. The woman did not believe she could go everywhere and tell her business. But I want to let you know that when your problem, my friend, is sensitive, Jesus is sensitive enough not to broadcast your business everywhere. Amen? This woman did not believe she could go everywhere telling everybody what her problem was. Sometimes the problems that we have are not ones that we want to share. They are private problems. And if I thought that God was inclined to put my business in the streets, then I would be careful how I deal with God. But I'm so glad that I can tell Jesus all of my problems. I don't have to come to you and tell you my problems. I can tell it to Jesus. I can tell all about all of my problems. And when I tell God my problems, <laughs> he, he doesn't want to tell anyone. And, and while he's sensitive to help me, he doesn't put me on blast everywhere. There are some people you can't share your problem with because while you are telling them your problems, they excuse themselves now and then. And while they're on, they're on a three-way line telling someone else about your problem. Folks, you got to be careful about who you tell your problems to. But this woman, this woman, this woman was not one, this woman's problem was not one that she wanted to share with everybody. Nevertheless, it was a problem that was big enough to take all of her money. And no matter if she was wealthy when she started or she was poor, when you have spent all that you have on physicians and, and have none left, then you have another problem. Say if you please that, that people treat you the same way everywhere. And I dare to argue with you, for the fact is that when you don't have as much as other people do, there are some folks who look down on you. I, I read in the Bible of a young man called a prodigal son who had spent all his money. And when all his money was over, his friends left him. Well, some of you understand that. That's still true, right? Because if people even think that you have money, I found out that if you act like you have money, you can get some friends. So this woman couldn't pretend anymore. The first problem that she had was a physical problem. This problem is an unnatural loss of blood that had occurred for 12 years. She was weakened by this problem. Her whole life was affected by this malady. She had gone from one doctor to another, from one healer to another, and now she was relegated to seek the services of those who were less thought of. I want to let someone know this morning that obia men can't do it. Psychics can't do it. When you spend all your money on doctor and physician and psychologist and clairvoyance and, and soothsayers and voodoo priests and obia men, you will still have a problem. The only person who can solve your problem this morning is this powerful Jesus. I don't care which Obia man or voodoo priest you know in Jamaica or Haiti or in New Orleans or anywhere in America. I don't care. And some of you all go to these strange people. I know that. Christians go to these strange people. 
It's amazing to, to think about Christians seeking familiar spirits. Folks, the Holy Spirit you need to seek is the Holy Spirit. But, but when you have a problem, my friends, that the medical professions, obia men or voodoo priests can handle, you all need to go to the power source with Jesus. But, but, but no, but no, but no, her money's gone. And, and when you don't have money, people look at you differently. If you don't know that, I don't know where you are living. I, I remember when I was a kid. I, I remember when I was a little boy. I was around, I was in grade eight. And one day I went to my grandfather and I said, Granddaddy, you know, every day I go to him for my lunch money. And I went to my granddaddy. And I said, Granddaddy, I'm going to school. I need my lunch money. And I, and I said it to him. He said, Son, I don't have no money. And, and I thought he was joking. You know, your grandparents, you know, you were a kid. You know, you figure they have money. And I said it again. He, he said, Son, I don't have no money. And I said it a third time. And my grandfather said, Son, I cannot make blood out of stone. And, I, and for the first time, I realized that my granddaddy was broke. But, but, but what saved me at school? What, what, what saved me at school? We, I had some friends that there were days that I would buy lunch and, and all of us would rotate to buy lunch. And, and then we had free lunch at school. So, so nobody knew I didn't have no money. So I went to school, no lunch money, but I wasn't hungry. So, so when we were ready for lunchtime, my boys went up, they buy lunch and we all eat. But, but friends, it's amazing the things you can't do when you don't have money. It's an inconvenience. It, it's very inconvenient when you don't have money. It, it's amazing the things that you cannot do when you don't have money. There are places you can't go. There are things you cannot do. There are places you can't live. There are things you cannot wear and there are cars you cannot drive. And sometimes if you are in school, you can't even pay your school tuition. So it, 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 it's, it's convenience, my friend. Inconvenient when you don't have money. This woman was broke. She spent all her money on physicians and, and obia men and voodoo priests and nothing was left. She was relegated to find a source outside of her. And I, I don't think that because it was long ago the woman was not changed because her money was gone, but it gets deeper than that. She was not only considered less because her money was gone, but back then there were, there were laws. There were laws that they have that were called ceremonial laws. One of which says that if you have an abnormal loss of blood, you are considered unclean. Not only for the duration of the time that you have the malady, but for seven days after. And therefore you are excluded from public worship. Well folks, how many of you know that if you have a problem, the place you need to be is in the house of God? But this woman was excluded from church. She couldn't go to church. She couldn't go to the mall. She couldn't go to work. Not even her husband could work because he too was unclean. So there is joy, my friends, in the house of God, even if you're flat broke. The fact is many look on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. No, 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 she's down upon her last but because she doesn't have any money and now she can't go to church it gets even more acute than that because this uncleanness was considered to be infectious this sickness was infectious in nature it was contagious so that if it has it if you were seen with someone with this problem, then you would become unclean also. There are some people that will treat you like that now. There are some people who will treat you like you're unclean today. But we don't have those kind of laws anymore. There are some folks that will be your friends when everyone is saying praise God for you. But when everybody turns on you, there are some folks that will go across the street and wave at you like this. How you doing? Happy Sabbath. Good morning. They don't talk to you. They don't. See, see, my friend, this woman got a serious problem. She was broke and she had an illness that was like a pebble dropped in the water of her life and its ripples began to spread. 
I, I don't know about you, but the woman got a problem. And the question is this morning, what do you do when you got a problem that nobody seems to be able to solve? What do you do when you can't go to the source? When you can't go to the house of God? What do you do when the people who should be on your side turn against you? What do you do when the doctors at the 16th hole of the golf club have gotten together and discussed your case and have determined that you either have some psychosomatic illness or is genetic in nature and they don't want you to visit their offices anymore? What do you do when you cannot go to your friends who are long-standing friends? What do you do when you seem forsaken? What do you do when the medical establishment treats you like nobody? What do you do when the church treats you like nobody? What do you do when your friends treat you like you don't exist? What do you do when you are forsaken by everybody? The answer is simple. You go to somebody who's got the power. And I suggest to you today that Jesus got the power. Are you listening to me, somebody? Jesus' power did not come from the ripple of his muscles or how cute he looked. But his power was greater than that. He had power that emanated from his soul. A power that was shown through his eyes. A power that was based on something, not just a feeling, but based on the fact that Jesus indeed was the son of God in human flesh. That he came to this earth to light up our life. When sin turned the lights off, Isaiah 59 says that our sin had separated us from God. But God's hand is not short that he cannot reach us or his ear heavy that he cannot hear us. Folks, God will not disconnect himself from us. And so in the fullness of time, God sent Jesus to bring us back to him. And Jesus, because he is God and man at the same time, he took hold of God with his divinity and he took hold of man with his humanity and pulled us together in him. So today I present to you this powerful Jesus. Are you listening to me, somebody? Jesus can handle your central problem. Jesus can handle your central problem so that all the other problems that come ringing away from it are taken care of he's got the power that's why i preach jesus I, I i don't preach a jesus that's a wimpy creature on a cross i i don't preach a jesus that's that's dead and gone but i preach a jesus that was dead buried and is resurrected a buddha grave is still occupied Confucius grave is still occupied. Muhammad grave is still occupied. Hare Krishna's grave is still occupied. And the Pharaoh's grave are still occupied. But Jesus' grave is empty. He's risen. He's alive. No grave could hold his body down, my friends. He's alive. And because he's alive, the Bible says he got the keys of death and the grave. Yes, he's alive this morning. Won't someone shout hallelujah up in this house? I, I, I preach a Jesus that can raise the dead and give sight to the blind. Cleanse the leper and heal all kinds of diseases. I, I preach a Jesus that can take you from the brothel to the baptistry. From the whorehouse to the church house. From the lion's den to a love relationship with him. From the gutmost to the utmost. I, I, I preach a Jesus that can step into your situation and change everything overnight. Won't someone say amen today? Amen. For there's no problem too big that, that Jesus can handle, and there's no problem too small that he doesn't care. Yes, Jesus cares. He knows and he understands. Are you listening to me, somebody? So today I bring you this, this powerful Jesus. So, so this woman, this woman said, I've run out of money. I've run out of friends. I'm down to the place where the doctors don't want to see me no more. For I can't pay my bills. That's serious stuff. So she said, now where do I go? This woman proposes in her mind and she said, I don't want to discuss my problem everywhere. 
I don't want to put my business out in the street. In fact, what I just want to do is just find Jesus somewhere. And if I could just touch, if I could just touch him, just, just, just touch him. Just, just touch Jesus. If I could just touch him. I don't have to talk with him. I don't have to have some grand dialogue with Jesus. I just want to touch him. Some of us love Jesus, my friends, but we will only come to Jesus if we can come on our own turn. We, we have to have some grand occasion to come to Jesus. Folks, when your situation gets bad enough, you don't need an occasion to come to Jesus, but you can slip to Jesus. The old preacher used to sing, for Jesus on the main line, tell him what you want. Jesus on the main line, tell him what you want. Jesus on the main line, tell him what you want. You can call him up. You can call him up and tell him what you want. I've got a telephone in my bosom, the old folks used to sing, and I can ring it up from my heart. Folks, your bill has been paid by Jesus on Calvary. Your long distance carrier has been already be cared for. For Jesus paid it all. All to him we owe. For even though sin has left a crimson stain, Jesus' blood washed it white as snow. Are you listening to me, somebody? So now this woman said, if I can put my hand on his clothing just, just to touch him. I believe I'll, I'll get me a blessing without him even recognizing that it was gone. For I believe that he's, he's not an ordinary man. I believe that there's power in this Jesus. I believe he does not come representing himself, but there's power from God in him. And if I, if I can just, just, just touch him, just touch him. If I can just touch his clothes. So now this little weak woman, she cannot be too large in fame now. She must have been wasted away during these 12 years. But with her little frail frame, she started to find where Jesus is. And when she discovered that he's not too far away, she starts to follow his trail until she finally gets to that place. One of my favorite writers said that this woman did not have enough strength to plan her way to Jesus. She probably could not even do like Zacchaeus and climb up into a, into a sycamore tree. All she could do was just to follow with hope in her heart. But Ellen White says that Jesus was moving one way. Then he turned around and started to come her way. Yes. I don't know about you, my friend, but I recognize that in my life, it was not me who found Jesus. It was Jesus who found me. If I had to find him, I don't know where I would be today. I didn't pursue him. He relentlessly pursued me. For I was sinking deep in sin, the old folks used to sing. Far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry and, and from the waters lifted me. Now safe am I, love lifted me. Love lifted me where nothing else could help. Love, love lifted me. Love lifted me. Yes, love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Folks, when you, when you and I were lost and, and alienated from the commonwealth of heaven and relegated to the prison of sin, God sent the monaganese, his only begotten son in the person of Jesus Christ and he sent him in the fullness of time to redeem us from the curse of sin and reinstate us in the family of God. I'm excited that God did not open the windows of heaven and shouted, you folks on earth, I love you. I'm glad he didn't do that. But the writer to the Romans says in Romans 5, 8 that God demonstrates his love towards us in that while we were still sinning, while we were still cursing, while we were still swearing, while we st were still angry, while we were still hating and gossiping and lying and backbiting and doing all kinds of evil things, Jesus died for us. We didn't love him. The Bible said we didn't love him. He first loved us. I'm glad that Jesus came after me. I was messed up, running around doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And Jesus found me one day. I told you my story. I work 
with the Department of Corrections in Jamaica for years, and I, I, I was raised with my grandparents, and they, they taught me the way of God, and I figured that I was now a grown man, I could do my own thing. And I left home, I started working with the Department of Correction, with bad men. And while I was working with these bad men, something strange happened. One day I was attacked by some of these ex-convicts and they, they ripped my body. They cut me at my throat, my, my neck, all over me. Left me for dead. When I was in the hospital, I, I lie on my back with tears running down my eyes. I said, God, if you, if, if you, if you spare my life, if, if you spare my life, I'll give it to you all the days of my life. I'll give it to you. And with tears running down my eyes, God heard my prayer. He cleaned me up. He sent me to college, trained me, and I said, go preach, boy. I'm excited that God loves sinners. He's not concerned about how messed up you are. He loves you. So, so when folks want to put you on the corner and put you on the box and, and relegate you to something who you are not, tell them that you're a, you're a child of a king. You're royalty. You are no little wishy-washy, wampy, pampy woman or man. You're a blood-bought child of God. You were washed in the precious blood of Jesus that flowed from Calvary. Somebody need to know today that Jesus loves you. He wants to save you. And respective of where you are, whatever you might be doing today, he can reach you where you are, but he, he loves you too much to leave you there. So don't let people tell you who you are. Let Jesus be your guide. Church folks will say stuff about you. Your parents might say stuff about you. Your friends will say stuff about you. But don't give them enough evidence to indict you. For Jesus loves you. He paid the price in full for your sins. So this morning you are set free. Free to live for Jesus. Yes, you are. This woman, my friend, recognized that all the doctors couldn't help her. There was no power in Obia men or psychics or physicians. They couldn't do it. She recognized that there was only power in the blood. For there is power. Power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power. Power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. So now this woman recognized that she needed healing. And now she said, if I could just touch, touch his garment. Now she found the power source, the power of a touch. Her, her pisteo, that's the word they use in the Greek. Her pisteo touches pistota. Her faith touches Jesus' faithfulness. And she experienced something that she has never experienced before. See, see my friends, unlike other miracles that Jesus performed when he touched someone or told them to do something, in this situation, Jesus didn't do anything great or supernatural. He, he was just teaching the multitudes and minding his own business. And this tired, sick, weak, bloodletting an unclean woman came up from nowhere through the crowd and touched Jesus. See, see, my friends, I believe there were other people in the crowd that was sick. I believe somebody brushed up against Jesus. I believe somebody with a more serious disease than the woman probably brushed up against Jesus. My question is simple. Why didn't they get healed? See, my friends, this was not just a touch. She didn't just willy-nilly happen to touch Jesus. This was no little wishy-washy, mampy-pampy touch. She was intentional about touching Jesus. Folks, there are times in our life when we are facing problems, we just can't come to Jesus any little old way. We, we got to organize it. I, I like how, how, how El, El, Elder, El, Elder Eva Lewis prayed. When she prays, she organizes for God's people. We just can't come to God and just say, God, you, like we don't know who. We, we're talking to the king of the universe. We need to come to God and tell him what's going on in our life. We need to be intentional about how we come to God. 
This woman knew she had a problem. Doctors couldn't help her. Psychics couldn't help her. Physician couldn't help her. Psychiatrists couldn't help her. Psychologists couldn't help her. Voodoo priests couldn't help her. Obia men couldn't help. She did everything. And she was still bleeding. Can you believe that? I'm glad women ain't bleeding like that today. But Jesus is available. And she tried everything. But now she realized that, that there's something bigger than her. There was a power source that's outside of her realm. And that power source was Jesus. So she was intentional about touching Jesus. The Bible says that without faith, it is impossible to serve Jesus. Because those who come to him must believe that he rewards those who diligently, those who diligently seek him. This touch, my friend, was one of absolute desperation. A naked faith. She had nothing to lose. Besides, she lost everything she had financially and doctors, voodoo priests and obia men. She even lost her friends and family because nobody wanted to associate themselves with her anymore. All she had left was to place herself at the mercy of this Jewish itinerant rabbi. Now this woman, this woman gathers up all the faith that she has in her life. And when she saw Jesus coming, I don't know if she had enough power to maintain her spot. She may now be pushed along, pushed along by the crowd. But she's determined that she'll do anything now to see Jesus. And she presses her way. She presses her way close enough to reach down, down to the hem of his garment. And when her hand touches his garment, I, I, I don't know what she may have felt. But she knew that she was healed. She knew she was healed. Folks, there are times we pray to God. And we know God hears us. We know we can feel it. I asked God, when, I remember when I was in college, I, I like to give stories about my, I'm not afraid to say, I was in college and I, I was broke, man. I was broke. I remember when I, my first semester, they told me that I was working too much money before I came to school, so they, they couldn't give me no grant. And, and I was saying, these people know what life is about. And I, I went to college my first year, they, you know, I went through, and the second year I realized I, I couldn't find, no, I was broke. And I said, God, you know what? You own a cattle up on a thousand hill. You, 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 you don't number your cattle by, 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 the, by the heads. You, you number them by the hills. So I, I know you can. And I, I went to God. I, 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 I walked away from where I was living one Sunday morning. And I said, God. And I went into this biology trail and I knelt down. I, I was walking and I was crying. I said, God, you know I'm flat broke, what I'm telling you. I'm broke. And I went into the, the biology trail and I, I knelt down beside a little chair that they had. And I said, God, I need a computer. I, and I tell God, I said, God, I, 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 need a, I need a laptop. I need a desktop. I told God, I didn't need just one computer. I said, I need one to take to class, to take notes. And I need one to stay home so I can use that when I'm home. And I said, God, I need two computers. And I need tuition. You got to tell God what you need. No, no, no wonder. You see, we, 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 we put God in a little box and we start questioning God. Don't question God. Wonder if God makes sense. God don't have to make sense. He made sense. So, so I, I didn't question. I just tell God, say, God, you know my need. But I'm telling you, I need two computers. I need money for tuition. I don't know how you, but I know you can do it. And I started praying. And I, and I was crying. I I, I'm not afraid to tell you. I cried. I was crying and praying. I said, God, I need some money. I'm flat broke. And while I was there praying, I, 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 I heard a sound. And it got me scared. I was wondering what happened. And when I looked up, I saw a show of leaf. Before I, I heard, I said, God, show me that you're going to answer this prayer. I said, God, I need, to, I need to get, I can't leave this place without an answer. Like Jacob, God, you've got to bless me. I'm not leaving you till you bless me. And I said, God, show me. Show me that you answered my prayer this morning. And when I was praying, I heard a sound and I looked up and I saw a shower of leaf falling right before me. And when I looked around, there were, there were no leaves falling nowhere else. It was right, and I said, thank you, Jesus. Now I know that, that you answer my prayer. So folks, when, when, when we come to God, don't come to God 
and be afraid. Tell God your problem. He's your problem solver. He, he can fix it, but you got to believe. Faith is an action word. You got to act upon your faith. Don't just believe that God can do it, but act upon it. Walk out and walk believing that you have a God who is powerful. Walk with your chest high. Say, yes, God, you do it. People need to know that your God is powerful. This woman knew that if she... Listen, this woman was so, was so serious that she didn't want to hug Jesus. She didn't want to have no conversation with Jesus. She said, look here, I just want to touch your, your garment. I went, we come into that as I go through. He, she said, I just want to touch, just touch the fringe of your garment. I don't want to touch all of it. Just, just, the, just the fringe of it. That's what how powerful her faith was. And this woman walked up to Jesus and just touched the fringe of his garment. That's great faith. I, I wish we had faith like that in church today. She presses her, her way to Jesus. But she's determined that she'll do anything now. And she presses her way close enough to reach down to the hem of his garment. And when her hand touches it, I don't know how she felt, but I knew she was healed. But she knew she was healed. Yes, she was healed. I, I, I did a little digging in, in, into this. You know, I, I, I got to do some research. You got to know that I read something. I don't come to you with an empty head. I, I did a little digging into this. It's, it's an electrifying moment. If you were part of that society as Jesus, if you were part of the Hebrew nation as Jesus was, you wore at the border of your garment a blue fringe. The blue fringe, the blue fringe represented your determination to do what God commanded. It was acknowledgement that you are not just anybody. Listen to this. You are not just anybody, but that you are one who have decided that you would do whatever God says do. You recognize that you are a part of a peculiar nation. You recognize that you were called by God to do certain things. Friends, I believe it's time for somebody in this strange time that we live in to identify themselves not so much with a blue border, but simply by obeying whatever God says do. It's time for people to start obeying what God says. Well, my friends, this blue border represented that decision to obey. It was a symbol of faithfulness, if you please. So now, would you allow me some homiletic privilege? Would you allow me to suggest that when this woman gathers up all her faith, in one touch. And then she reaches down to the fringe of his garment. That what she probably touched was the blue fringe that represented Jesus' faithfulness. Jesus' faithfulness to God. So her faith now touches his faithfulness. Faith touching faith. That's how we need to approach God. Your faith touches his faithfulness and when our faith touches his faithfulness then things are gonna happen we gotta believe my friends that God is powerful I want someone to leave here today believing that whatever we ask God the Bible says ask God for he will give us if we ask him for bread he won't give us a stone if we ask him for fish he won't give us a snake because if, if evil parents can give good gifts to their children don't you believe God <laughs> will give you that which you, you really need. He will. So this woman believed that. And her faith now touching his faithfulness. Folks, God is the father of all. Jesus acknowledged the power of God. And the blue fringe around his garment was testimony that while he was God in human flesh, he was willing to do what God says. So now this woman reaches out to touch the blue fringe. And as our faith touches that faithfulness, something happens. There's an immediate change. You tell me that's not power. So Jesus says, I like that. If, 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 if when this woman had touched Jesus, Jesus had kept on walking, I would be disappointed. But, but Jesus recognized that something happened. So Jesus says, somebody touched me. Remember now the woman has been 
been treated by the medical establishment like nobody. She's been treated by the church like nobody. She's been treated by her friends like nobody. In fact, every day of her life, there was a litany of voices that confirmed, you are nobody, you are nothing. But now Jesus says, somebody, somebody touch me. I, I like that. Now this woman who didn't have a name, she was a nobody. She was an outcast by her friends. Everybody forsake her. And now she touched Jesus and Jesus said, somebody touch me. You are somebody. See, see my friends, you're not really somebody until Jesus says so. I, I don't care what you possess. I don't care where you live or what you drive. I don't care about your socioeconomic background. Until Jesus says, you are somebody, you are nobody. See, my friends, in, in the Middle East, women were treated a little lower than dogs. So now she was moved from a dog to a daughter. I remember the story of the, the, the Syrophoenician woman. This woman had a daughter that was sick with epilepsy. She was demon-possessed. And this woman was pressing through the crowd. And Peter and the rest of the disciples was telling her, leave the master alone. And this woman, this woman wasn't a Seventh-day Adventist. You all need to know that. She ain't no Seventh-day Adventist. She didn't go to no Sabbath school. She didn't go to no Christian school. She didn't study no member verse. She, did, she, did, she, didn't, she wasn't on the Bible ball team. She didn't know nothing about church. She was a sinner. And this woman heard that Jesus was in town and she, she took her daughter to be healed. She believed that Jesus could heal her. And while she was there, the disciples were, and Jesus looked at her and said, I, 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 only, I, I only come to save the lost house of Israel. So Jesus was telling her, I, I didn't come for you. I didn't come, but Jesus was not telling her in any derogatory way. Jesus was saying, I, I came for Israel, but if you believe, I'm for you too. But, but this lady didn't understand, so she was pushing her away. And Jesus said, I, I'm not here for you. The disciples said, go away. And she was still pushing her way to Jesus. And as she pushed her way to Jesus with her daughter, and Jesus saw her, Jesus said, you're not worthy to eat the bread from the master's table. And she said, you know, this woman was so smart. She said to Jesus, Jesus, even the crumbs that fall from the master's table, the dogs eat. And Jesus said, when Jesus heard that, Jesus said, woman, you, your faith is powerful. You are healed. Your daughter is healed. So this woman who didn't know Jesus, she didn't wonder if Jesus could heal her. She went to Jesus believing that even though she was a nobody, she was seen as a dog, but now Jesus saw her as a woman who, who had faith enough to believe that he could heal her daughter. And when Jesus saw the faith, she said, woman, your faith is powerful. And we see other examples of faith in the Bible with Jairus when Jesus said to the centurion that, that, that there has never been any faith, not in Israel. A Roman centurion said to Jesus, Jesus, you don't have to go to my house. Stay where you are. Don't leave where you are, Jesus. I believe, I, listen, that guy had more faith than me. He said, Jesus, don't come to my house. I, I believe, I believe that you can heal my daughter. And before the guy reached home, his daughter was healed. Not because he was a Seventh-day Adventist or he was good, but because he believed and he acted upon his faith in Jesus Christ. His daughter was healed. So this woman, this woman now who was seen as a dog, now she was a daughter. Jesus said, no, you're a daughter. And even today, my friend, in the Middle East, a lot of value is not placed on women. In America, women are liberated. In the Middle East, you got to listen to what your husband say. If they say you to wear up the burqa and all the things that they say you have to wear to cover yourself, you better do it. Then they throw you the house. In America, women don't have to do that. In the Middle East, women are treated a little higher than dogs. They are still subjugated, harassed, used, abused, and misused by men. See, see my friend, Jesus understood the culture of his time. And he also knew where this woman was in her life. He knew she was physically, socially, spiritually, 
and ceremonially unclean. But Jesus cut through all that political red tape. He cut through all the traditions and customs and went straight to her need. He knew she needed healing and that he was passing her way that day. But he wanted her to come to him who is the source of life and the one who has the power to heal and destroy any malady and sin in her life. I'm excited that Jesus didn't call her madame or call her a girl or call her a lady or call her a miss or missus or a sister. He didn't call her a sinner or a woman, but he called her a daughter. I'm excited that Jesus called her a daughter. No, she was somebody. She was now reinstated to the commonwealth of Israel. Jesus calling her daughter, signifying that she was engrafted into the commonwealth of heaven and into the royal family of God. Peter tells us that we are an elect race in 1 Peter 2.9. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a special people for God's own possession. That we may know, that we may show forth the praises and excellences of him who called us out of darkness into his wonderful and marvelous light. She was no, this woman, my friend, was no longer a sin-sick, hemorrhaging woman, but a saint washed in the blood of Jesus. Someone need to say amen today. For what can wash away my sin? The old folks used to sing, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is that flood that, that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Now this woman is sick and have no money. I, I doubt it if she had insurance in those days. Or she had to go to the doctor today, she would need insurance. She would have to have an insurance number. Friends, I, I submit to you all today that when you are born, they, they, they give you a birth certificate number. When you live in America, they give you a social security number. When you go to court, they give you a case number. When you buy a car, you get a tag number. Before you can drive, you have to get a driver's license number. And when you die, they give you a grave plot number. Numbers. Numbers. We all have to deal with numbers. But this woman is no longer a number. She's somebody. Yes, she's somebody. Before she was a number, nobody knew her. Nobody knew nothing. All they knew that she was sick. They didn't know her name. All the women who gossip about her, all they know that she was hemorrhaging. They didn't take the time to find out what her name was. But Jesus cared. Someone needs to know that Jesus cares about you. You are the apple of his eye. He loves you, friends. All of us inside here, Jesus loves us the same way without any of us being jealous about it. He has the power to do that. His love is efficacious enough to reach all of us where we are. And he's not partial about his love. He loved Ella Lewis, Ella, Ella Levy, all the folks in the church just like how he loved me. He doesn't love the pastor more. The elders, no, he doesn't. He loves us with the same love. That's why the Bible says that God demonstrated his love not to Cleon Walker. He demonstrates his love towards us that while we were still sinners, he died for us. Somebody need to know that this morning. That irrespective of who you are, where you are from, your, your socioeconomic background has nothing to do with your salvation. Going to, if you grew up in a Seventh-day Adventist church like home like me and go to Christian school, that has nothing to do with Jesus and your salvation. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you will be as lost as Judas and Satan. That's how serious it is. You, you can't get it more serious than that. God loves us, my friend, but he wants us to come to him. He wants us to come to him individually. Yes, we can come together as a church collectively and pray together, but we have to find that, that, that quiet place with Jesus. We've got to spend time early in the morning. Some folks just wake up in the morning, they take a shower, jump in their car, they go on to work, and they forget that it's God who wakes. Look here, I learned one thing that I don't use alarm to wake me up. 
I don't use, I, I wake up naturally at 5 o'clock every morning. If you believe that your alarm wake you up this morning, take one down to the burial ground and see what happened. Nobody going to get up. It's Jesus that wakes you up this morning. So, so we need to understand, my friends, the power of Jesus in our life. And when we understand the power of Jesus in our life, it makes our Christian life or Christian experience more powerful. This woman understand that everything that she did fail. And the only person that she could go to was Jesus. As the song says, when you try everything and everything fails, try Jesus. Have you tried Jesus this morning? We need to try Jesus. We tried everything. We, we, we tried our investment. We, we, we tried all, all the things that we are blessed with. And we still come up empty. We still come up short. Somebody need to try Jesus this morning. So now this woman was no longer a number. She was somebody. Friends, I, I posit you all today that when you think you, 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 it's all over and you, you, you think you, you have lost it all, the old preacher used to say, when you think you've lost it all and you, you, you haven't got a friend, Jesus will still Jesus will still be there. I, I submit to you all today that when you find yourself at the end of your rope, Jesus will give you hope. When you are down to your last dime, he'll catch you right in time. When you are between a rock and a hard place, Jesus will give you saving grace. And when you are between the devil and the deep blue sea, one day you'll stand on a sea of glass and sing the victory song. Won't somebody say amen this morning? I, I suggest to you today that the power of God will lift you up will turn you around and he'll place your feet on healing ground because he promised that he'll never leave you nor forsake you, but he'll be with you always, even to the end of the age. Friend, this woman declared triumphantly, if I could just touch the bottom of his garment, then I know I would be healed. I would be made whole. See, my friend, that's, that's childlike uncompromising, unpenetrable, unswerving, untouchable, unstoppable, bedrock, sincere and naked, true faith. Folks, for us to experience the power of God in our lives, we have to exercise uncompromising, unrelenting, unwavering, unbridling, go for broke faith in a God who is able to step into our messed up of an excuse of a life and change everything overnight. Oh, I heard someone singing, I just can't give up now. I've come too far from where I've started from. Nobody told me the road would be easy, but I don't believe you brought me this far to leave me. Friends, when you come in the presence of Jesus, you are no longer a nobody but somebody. Friends, when you come in contact with Jesus, he changes you completely. Your, your diet is changed, your dress is changed, your language is changed. If you used to curse, you don't curse no more. Your behavior is changed. Your whole life is changed. And even your name is changed. For there's a new name, John says, written down in glory, and it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. And the white robe angel sing the story. A sinner has come home, for there's a new name written down in glory. And it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. With my sins forgiven, and I'm bound for heaven, never, never more to Rome. Are you listening to me, somebody? She was just a number, just an ordinary woman that needed to be healed by Jesus. Then all of a sudden, she came face to face with Jesus. And in fear and trembling, she confessed to Jesus and everyone around that she was the one that touched him. The crowd and the disciples didn't know who touched Jesus. Only the woman and Jesus knew. Because Jesus declared in verse 45 that somebody touched me. This was not just an ordinary touch, Jesus says. It was a special touch because healing power has just left my body. You know Peter, Peter was always talking. And when Jesus said, somebody touch me, Peter was saying, Master, how dare you say somebody touch you? Look at all these people brushing up against you. Somebody must have touched you. And Jesus said, hold up, Peter, hold up, hold up. We're not on the same wavelength. Listen, 
You don't understand what's going on. This is a special touch. Somebody touched me because healing power had just left my body. Peter had to keep, God had to keep, Jesus had to keep Peter quiet. Sometime in our life, there are some people who are saying negative things to us, and we got to shut them up when Jesus is doing stuff. There are some, listen, there are some people, in, when you're praying, don't invite them to come and pray with you. Don't. There are some things you do in life. Don't invite some, some people to, to participate. Because they don't believe. They don't believe in your dream. I, I went to a place one time and when I was in Georgia. I, I have all these experiences. I, I, I went to this church and after we... I think, did I preach a Sabbath? But somehow, church was finished and the, I was tired. And the elder said to me, Pastor, we need to go to the hospital. I said, for what? I was tired, man. And he said, a brother is in the hospital. He's sick. He's sick with lupus. I was tired. And I said, okay, let's go. And I went to the hospital and I looked at the guy. He had a young wife. Young, nice-looking wife with a pretty little baby. And I looked at the guy and my heart broke. I, I, and I looked at the guy and I said, man, I am not young like him. But I don't want to die with lupus. And, and I looked at it and I said, God, I don't know what you're going to do, but I know you can do something. And I, and I stand in the room and my eyes were filled with tears. And I, and I turned to the folks who were in the room, his wife, his, mother, his wife, mother, and everybody else. I said, look here, if, if you all don't believe that God can do something for this guy, you all need to leave the room right now because I'm going to pray. I don't have no power, but I believe. I believe that God has the power to do something for this guy. And nobody left the room. And I prayed, I prayed till I, I felt my body start shaking. I prayed, I said, God, I don't have no power within myself, but I know you can heal this guy. He's young, he has a family, a, a two-year-old baby. I, I'm asking you to give him some more life like Hezekiah. Save his life. And I prayed and I prayed. And I, I walked away. I didn't know what God do. I, I didn't. Ask God what he do. I just walk away believing that God was going to do something. Six months after I was at church and I heard someone saying, Pastor, and I look around. I was one and I fixed my glasses and I look. It was the same guy. I didn't know it was him. And I said, hey, what's up, bro? He said, man, I went back to the doctor and they told me the lupus is gone. I, I get excited when he said that to me. Folks, there is, there is power. There is power in prayer. You and I need to know that we can come to God by faith. There are some things you don't invite some people to. If they don't believe, leave them. Go by yourself. Look here. I have, some, I have a brother and a sister. And there are things that I do I don't tell them. You know why? They don't believe what I believe. They go to church. We are all at different places in our life. But we got to know that when we come to God, He hears us. We can't come to God and start wonder, man, can God do this? No, don't do God that, folks. We must come. Those who come to God must believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. For without faith, it is impossible to please God. Friends, I submit to you today that when your life is in touch with the Galilean teacher, you'll never be the same. For his beautiful image will be reproduced in your life and restoration, transformation, healing, and salvation will take place. For by beholding, we are changed from glory to glory. Someone in the house this morning is hemorrhaging. I don't know who you are. I know I'm hemorrhaging. You might be hemorrhaging financially, spiritually. Your marriage might be hemorrhaging. You might be hemorrhaging on your job. Your family might be hemorrhaging. But Jesus can stop any hemorrhage this morning. Jesus can stop the hemorrhage of gossip. He can stop the hemorrhage of lying. He can stop the hemorrhage of anger. The hemorrhage of adultery, the hemorrhage of criticism, the hemorrhage of hate, the hemorrhage of 
animosity, whatever it is that is causing you and I to hemorrhage today, I want to let you know that Jesus is in the house and you can touch him this morning and be healed. You can touch him. Anyone here for the appeal song? You can touch him this morning. You can touch Jesus. Don't be afraid, my friends, to touch Jesus. He's in the house this morning. If you are here this morning, you want to stand with me and say, God, I know you are here. I am hemorrhaging. Somebody's hemorrhaging this morning. I'm hemorrhaging. You want to say, God, I know I'm hemorrhaging. If you want to come on down front, so we pray for you. Whatever your hemorrhaging is, Jesus can stop your hemorrhaging this morning. He did it for the woman with the issue of blood. He did it for the Syrophoenician woman. He did it for Jairus' daughter. He can stop your hemorrhaging this morning. Whatever your hemorrhaging is this morning, Jesus can stop it. Go ahead, come on.
Hallelujah. Jesus, Jesus, how I, how I trust him. How I prove him over and over. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. Oh, for grace to trust him. Won't you pray with me again today? Great God and our Heavenly Father, we have, we have heard your word. Lord, you have spoken to your people today. Thank you for removing me out of the way so you could speak to your people. Lord, if there's ever a time we need you, we sure do need you now. Lord, your people are hemorrhaging. But we know that you are in the house this morning. And we just ask that your people will just reach out and touch you as you pass by. For if we touch you, Lord, we will be healed. Oh, my Lord, I pray that you will be with us as we leave from this place today. Lord, I pray that whatever we do or say will be a means of telling someone that we have been with Jesus. Then, Lord, we long for the day when you will come, when there will be no more sickness, no more crying, no more hemorrhaging, no more dying, no more disease, but there will be peace and joy with you forever. Lord, help us to be faithful to you. So that when you come, we along with all those who are faithful will stand with you on the sea of glass and sing the victory song, home at last. Home at last, praise God Almighty. We are home, yes, hallelujah. We are home at last. May this be our asking, our desire, as we wait upon you in the sweet and wonderful and holy and majestic in the name of Jesus. And let all God's people who believe say amen and amen god bless you all and have a wonderful sabbath there is power in the blood would you be free from the burden of sin there is power in the blood Thank God for the blood of Jesus today that can wash away all my sins. Just one or two announcements. I want to thank um, Pastor Clean Walker for his timely message. And we ask that the Lord will continue to use him as he ministered to us in this part of the vineyard. I'd like for us to remember that the funeral service for Brother John Greenaway, some of us may know him, he once was a member here, and then he went to the Cambridge Church, and uh, that's where his membership was last. And the funeral service will be at Holden Dunn Lawler Funeral Home in Westwood, 55 High Rock Street in Westwood. So please remember that it's tomorrow from 2 p.m. till 5 p.m. On last week, we had a game and Berea won the game. And guess what? This week we'll have another game. This game starts at 6 p.m. And it is to be held at the Dorchester Boys and Girls Club at Talbert Avenue. So let's come out and support the young people and give them a cheer here and there. And if you can bring something special in your pocket for the young people, that would be nice. You want to hear the time, Carl? Six o'clock, 6 p.m. You're welcome. As, as we worship today, we would like to remind you of, um, I thought I saw Sister Keena relative somewhere in the back, right there, she's here, to take those individuals who want to put their half page 
their quarter page or their full page ad or memory in the journal, the 110 journal. So she will be right there in the back. You have this week and next week, the 17th, which will be the last week before the journal goes to the printers. And guess what? Brother Milton Samuels is in the elders room waiting for those who need their pictures to be taken. So if you were wondering how am I going to get the pictures to go into this journal, he's right there waiting on you so that he can have your picture taken and you could put whether it's a quarter page, half page or a full page ad in the paper. I noticed that some of us came in a little late and we don't want you to miss the opportunity during this given season to go back home with your offering. We would like to provide the means for you to leave the offering, the offering of praise that you brought here to Jesus today. So don't take it back home. The ushers during the singing of the hymn will collect those offerings and the tithe that you brought in to worship in the house of the Lord today. At this time, we'll have our closing hymn. Have the ushers come up to collect the offering this morning. Let us all stand for the benediction. We are indeed grateful to you for the time you have spent here in your presence. We thank you for the words that was brought to us telling us that we should look to you because you are the source through whom we live, move, and have our being. Now, as we are about to quit these sacred walls, but not from your presence, could you go with us? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey.
his peace be with you till we meet again. May his peace be with you till we meet again. May his love
Don't do it. And the reason why I'm saying that is because the devil didn't want to have it that he came up here and came with the same friends and left with the same friends. two things that this setting reminds me of. In the most holy place in the temple, and the instance of fire takes the smoke, and the smoke takes our prayers to heaven. That's what, the, that's what they did back then. Then isn't it amazing that you guys just put your poor God in the fire, and then it is snowing, and the Bible refers to your sins or to your life now being white as snow. And so I think that this is a fitting time that your incense and your prayers are going up to God and he's answering, letting you know that everything in your life that's unlike him has been washed in you until now you're as white as snow.